What's up, y'all? Welcome to Bookie's Place. You know what we do here. We talk about things that really matter. We don't talk about the glitz. We don't talk about the glam. We talk about the grit and the grind, the necessary ingredients that you need to do success. And we bring people that you love, people that you admire to come here and share their stories with you. And in the building today, I have the one and only, the founder of Elevation Church in Lagos, Nigeria, a church that is doing extremely well. Ladies and gentlemen, drum roll, give it up for the one and only Pastor God. <laughs> Hi, Bukie. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. So good to see you. Wow, it's been so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But thank God for thank God for social media. It's like I see you all the time. <laughs> Same here. I've been I've been seeing you know all the stuff that you're doing, uh, and uh, this show in particular. I think I've been able to catch a glimpse of um, some of the people who have been on the show. And, you know, it's such a great job that you're doing. I love the setup of your studio, you know, and all that. It's been great. great Thank great. you. <laughs> Thank you. You guys thought us to be excellent. It, it's lack of excellence is not, is not an excuse. It is, it is unacceptable. So thank you. <laughs> All right, so let me tell you what we do here because I don't want to take any extra second. This is Bookie's Place. Welcome to Bookie's Place. What we do here is in a world where everybody is talking about things that don't matter. Everybody's talking about the glamour, the awards, the accolades, you know, the glitz, the glam. We don't talk about that. We talk about necessary things. We equip people, practical tools, you know, that they need to do destiny, you know, and this is how we do it. Your story, you share your journey, how it was with you. You know, it's not enough to just say seven ways to success, six ways to achieve this. If I say my story, it is more relatable. So you're going to start from the beginning. It's about ordinary people in their ordinary lives doing extraordinary things and we know you've done so well so you're gonna start from the beginning where you were born transition into primary secondary uni and then and pastor godman anywhere you flow to we flow with you we go with you the boat is yours drive it welcome to okay, Bookie's um, thank you thank you for having me it's really nice to be here and like i said you you, you you've been quite inspiring in on many levels with what you're doing right now because I know it yeah. takes a lot uh, to run uh, you know something like this um, okay so this is Godman Akinabi um, I was born as um, uh, my first name is, is Abiodu which is a Yoruba name from southwest Nigeria uh, I was born into a Muslim family most people don't know that uh, you know so um, my dad was a, a uh, businessman, politician uh, in the in the old or your state, the bigger or your state, which is or your and Oshun state. Um, I'm from Ibora, you know your state. Uh, my my peer, my 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 dad lived uh, you know partly in Ibadan and then also as a, a settlement in Ibora, where um, he eventually retired into. Um, I was um, I was born during you know Christmas and all that, so the. Uh, the story I'm, I was told, I was actually born while they were at home for Christmas in my hometown. So I was actually born in Ibora. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. A lot of my siblings were not born there, but somehow I was born there. Most of my siblings were born in the Ibadan and, you know, other places where my parents lived. Because my dad didn't live there where we were growing up. He, he just used to go back home. So I was born on, on 28th of December. So they were back home and they gave back to me there. Uh, very symbolic, you know, like Jesus born in a manger. So you probably, yeah, <laughs> you probably haven't heard the name of my hometown before, you know, let alone knowing that. I was me, I've born. heard you that before now. Me, I've heard <laughs> You know, so, um, so my, 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 you know, I, I grew up in the battle mostly. I uh, went to school there, uh, um, especially my high school days. I was in government college, by the um, And that was where I started to gain some sense of meaning to life. 
because getting into uh, to into high school, my my brothers now I'm from a relatively big family, um, and my dad had about maybe about twenty seven or close to thirty of us, you know, and all that. He had many women in his life. He was a very responsible man. Um, it's late now. Uh, uh, passed on in 2010. It was over 80 when he passed. He lived a good life. Uh, but one of the things was that he had many women in his life. When I was growing up, there were maybe like four women in the house. Uh, at any given point in time, there would be like three women in the house that, I mean, mothers in the house. My mom was there consistently all through. So I grew up in a food house of commotion kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, Fujas of commotion back in the day, uh, where you, you know it's a place where more like anything goes. Everybody, you know, just it, it was just it was just a funny place. That's how I grew up. So today, when people ask me, "Oh, uh, you you seem to know how to connect with people, you know, have a lot of people around you," I said I didn't have an option when I was going. God literally prepared me for this by putting me in a home where if you don't want anybody on your case, somebody will be on your case. <laughs> you know, because it, it was just too rowdy, too many. We were six from my mom. Yeah. And the woman that had the least out of maybe like the four of them in the house had five. You know, so you, you can just imagine all of us were there and we're all living in the same house. So wow. you couldn't attack our house. We, we never locked our door. I mean, how do you have 30 people in the house and somebody says you want to come and attack us? Uh, you, 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 you missed your way that day because I really good to <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that, that's, that's the kind of, of, of you know, home I grew up in. And um, uh, my, my dad also, like I said, from a Muslim background, his dad happened to be the chief imam of, that, of, of, of my village of Ibora. So it was, a, it was a bit of a strong Muslim background. I, used to, I tell people that if, when I was growing up, if you ask me, what are you going to do with your life? Where are you going to end up? If, you, if, you, if I was given a thousand options, pastor would not enter. There's no way. It's not possible. The pastor will not be a part of what I will pick as an option. Uh, I probably will have picked, you know, uh, musician or vulcanizer or <laughs> spray painter before I even get to, <laughs> before I even get to pastor. But there, there was no connection. Yeah. There was no reference point. Uh, I, mm. I was, uh, I was, I, I mean, I'm not a pastor style. Nobody in my family has ever been a pastor before. Uh, no Christian, you know, within the family. So how how can you then become a pastor? So my, my story, simply put, was getting into government college and, uh, um, you know, I just met this wonderful young man in the boarding house who, though as teenagers, they were already saved. They were already Christians, followers of Jesus. And their life, was what got me very curious. Yeah. So young people, I mean, okay, you can imagine, uh, we want to go, we're in the boarding house, we want to go to read, uh, you know, after school, we we'll go to the dining, we we'll, we'll eat, you know, went to siesta, and then it's time for prep, and then we'll go, and then these guys will get there, about four of them, and they'll say, uh, can we pray before we read? I me, mean, where I came from, I mean, which one is prayer? It's only food that you pray over, now, not book. You know, <laughs> that was that was my, and then I started to just look at them. What kind of human beings are these? Uh, I, I, I mean, and this were like 13, 14 year olds. So I was like, you know, so after a while, they started getting my attention. I'm just telling you how I became a Christian. They started getting my attention. Yeah, you know, just talking to me about about Christ, talking to me about you know um, all kinds of things. You know, do I believe in heaven and hell? Do I believe in you know, in prophecies, do I know about Nostradamus back in the day, you know, uh, then, you know, all those, the, the, the man who saw tomorrow and all that, mm -hmm. all those uh, predictions and some of the mm -hmm. predictions that came, you know, so I started to think about it. <laughs> Somebody actually predicted things and it, it happened that way. And then uh, one of those guys, I said, you, you know that real predictions are also in the Bible and it came to pass like that in the Bible. So it was, it was probably God that was showing Nostradamus things that he was mm -hmm. saying. You know, I can't forget all those things because those were the things that got me curious uh, to start to think about my life in a different way and then listen to them more. The day I gave my life to Christ, it was a Friday. I was just leaving the Jumat service. And then I met one of them who said, ah, have you forgotten that we invited you for fellowship today? Because we used to have fellowship every Friday. And I just said, just so that this, the funny thing was that they were the most brilliant in my class. Mm -hmm. And where we had like a group of five who were like the most brilliant. I was, were only two of us that were not 
like now with the benefit of hindsight, they were not Christians in terms of being born again out of mm-hmm. five or six, you know. So, um, so I just thought those guys are good. They know what they're doing. They're very well behaved. They don't get into trouble. They, 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 they they're very cerebral and all that. Uh, in fact, c- can I shock you? One of them who was not a, a who was a day student, as at the time, actually his parents relocated from the U.S. back to Nigeria, and then they brought him to my school, Government College of and was a day student. And they lived not far from school. This guy, they will actually give him. I think he was probably maybe fifteen. They 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 will give him the car key to drive to school because he was very responsible. In, they would never give me khaki in my house because I was I was a bad boy. <laughs> and, so, and he had two of his brothers, uh, um, maybe one 11, one 13. They, they were all in the same school. He would put them in the car, drive them to school, pack the car under the tree. They would go to class and then after school, they would, and they would go. And I used to look at him. Shegun Salami, I would look, used to look at Shegun Salami. Ah, how, can, how can they trust this boy like this? Can I be trusted like this? That was how their life actually got my attention. But what I didn't know then was that he, he, he was already developing a relationship with God, you know. And that was what affected his, his mindset that he was so controlled and tempered. Mm. But those are the things that, that got my attention, really and truly. That these guys were very well behaved. As in the school I'm talking about, I mean, we used to scale fences at night, go out there, uh, you can go party, go buy stuff from outside, mix with bad boys. These boys will not do any of those things. And I used mm. to tell, and where I came from, my older brothers were already in University of Ibadan, University of Lagos. They were caught boys. Yeah, my own older brothers. They were caught boys. When they come home, eh, you see all kinds of things on them. And I was aspiring to be like them. I wanted to smoke weed. Yeah. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to see, my one of my brothers had a confraternity poster on his door, his room at home. My parents don't know anything about it. They didn't know that it was a year poster. <laughs> it was, it was, it, and he was displaying it anyhow. And I was aspiring to that. But as God will have it, I got into <laughs> into high school, and these were the kind of boys I was mixing with. And these boys were just, they were just blowing my mind. And that was how I was actually really attracted to. Uh, exploring the Christian faith. And like they said, the rest is history. I went to that fellowship that day. They had an adult from town who came to preach. And my heart was melted. I decided to give my life to Christ. Um, you know, and I, I didn't look back. I was I was seriously uh, kind of attacked, if I can put it that way, because my dad uh, was a prominent uh, uh, Muslim person, Muslim person. So the day I resumed at my school, the 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 head of administration of the entire school, or the VP at me, was a person that my dad uh, took me to, and then eventually went to the principal. All of them were his junior in civil service because he used to be in civil service working with government before he, he then retired and went to business and then became a politician. Mm-hmm. He was a vice chairman of NPN, the old NPN in Oyo mm-hmm. State. You know, so he was he was in the in, in the league. I mean, we, we, sorry, I'm digressing. I grew up in a place where, uh, um, you know, when you wake up in the morning, we had a big compound. You had all those Volkswagen combi bus, we used to call them, with NPN logo on them, as in the house, house of a politician, with thugs smoking weed. So from like age five or six, I can tell you the, the uh, if, I, if somebody's smoking weed, I know it's weed. So that's, that's, you know, the way politics used to be in Nigeria. It was a do or die thing. A, a mm. politician went around with, you know, a retinue of, uh, of terrible Boy. boys, of, you know, like yeah. gang boys, you know, and all that. That was, that was how, I mean, I grew up in a home where uh, uh, I think it was the 82 politics, uh, 82 change of power. So that they wanted to burn down our house. We were, we, they woke us up at 1, 1 a.m. to, 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 Bury all of us to my grandma's house, <laughs> so that if you burn the house, they won't burn all the children in the house. <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the 
that's that's the, the kind of way I grew up. If you see me today, just say, oh, it's Pastor Godman, you know. It's, it, it, it's um, it, my upbringing was not a joke at all. It was not for the Lily Livard, yeah, sincerely. So you can then imagine how, how I got into that kind of a school and then had this interaction with these boys. And God will use boys of my age to challenge me with their lives their lives so much that it was become a turning point in my life and i'll start to reconsider my life to the point that i eventually then followed christ and not even knowing that it's not going to end there it's going to be a, a journey destiny that bring me to be a clergy you know to uh, you know and all that so it's 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 so interesting so from from there I, I, I got saved, spent, I think, the last two years in that school as a Christian. Uh, the Muslim community, they, I, there's one experience that I've, I've spoken about in most places where I've been asked this question. How God helps you when you cannot help yourself and when you don't even know what to do? So let me give you this experience. So the, 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 the guy who happened to be my senior, uh, this was... This guy is um, A-levels, you know, back in the day, he was in A-levels, so he was my senior. He, um, he, he came to me, he was a Muslim prefect for the school, and he knew that I was a Muslim boy in the school, coming to mosque. But when I stopped going, it took like four of the other guys, very senior guys, they came. And you know those days when a senior calls you out of your room, you run. So I ran up to them and they, 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 they asked me the question, you know, we know you're the son of an allergy. Uh, you, 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 you've been with us in this mosque. We heard you have been going to a, a fellowship. Um, uh, is it true or false? I said, it's true. They said, what's going on with you? You know, uh, are your parents aware of this? I was just looking at them. When they finished everything, they were threatening me, seriously. And when they finished, <laughs> they said, what do I have to say to this? I, I said, I, I, I don't know what to say. I said, literally right now, I'm confused. I need prayer. Will you pray for me? <laughs> <laughs> Till tomorrow, I didn't know where that came from. I was just like, you know, that just disarmed them. They just looked at me. I was like, what kind of... <laughs> <almost like> a... <laughs> <You know? laughs> we should pray for you. You know, that is true. Because uh, somebody invited me to fellowship, I I felt like something, you know, I felt something in my in my heart, and I and that's why I've been going back. But if you pray for me, God can turn, God can help me turn my head, so He can turn my head back. <laughs> 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 that know? was the political so, side of you coming out without you knowing it. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, when I think about it today, I just thought. Uh, you know, when God said, open your mouth and I will feel it. I just feel it. Feel it with anything that will just be in your <laughs> that, kind of that was what happened. And, you know, uh, um, that was how uh, the, eventually they left me. Uh, and then I got into my most senior class. Nobody disturbed me again. I mean, I lived as a Christian all through there. When I, one of the early days I went to, one of my half brothers, you know, my house was very porous and all that. I'd been given the Gideon's New Testament Bible in the boarding house after I gave my life to Christ. So that was the only Bible I had. And it was my travel bag from the boarding house. I got home and I don't know what my brother, my older brother, half older brother was looking for. And he brought that Bible out of my bag. I've never seen a Bible in my house before. So it was literally a taboo to bring a Bible into my house. We had a mosque in our compound. So I'm not talking about nominal Muslims. Yeah, we had a mosque. Yeah, there, uh, uh, my dad, there was no house that my dad had that he did, there was no mosque inside that house. Whether in Ibadan, whether in Ibarra, whether in other places, he would have a mosque in his house. You know, so when this guy brought out this kid, he went straight to my dad to show him. Yeah, that something is going wrong, that this guy had a Bible in his bag. That was where my problem with my, my parents started from. Um, it threatened my parents' marriage. That was the one that touched my heart the most because it's not easy for your mom to be crying to say, you are number five, my fifth child. Are you the one that was cut out my marriage? I have six, only you. Because my dad 
that was threatening at the point that if she could not convince me, you know, to to renounce my decision, mm -hmm. that that may you know affect the marriage and all that. So my mom will cry, talk, and as you can imagine, for a teenager, <clears throat> how important uh, I mean was I that I will now. As at the time I was talking about, my dad's oldest children, my mom happened to be like the third or fourth wife. So my mm -hmm. dad's oldest children, eh, they had left university, one of them had finished his PhD. You, you get what I'm talking about? Yeah, so yeah. I was supposed to be very inconsequential. Very, mm. yeah, very inconsequential. So how would, would it not be me that will be rocking the boat so much? Uh, that my dad, you know, uh, the causing problem between my dad and my mom, uh, all that, all that. But as God will have it, I got into my final class the day that my mom came to pack my stuff from the boarding house, uh, taking it home in the bedroom. I also just didn't know where the wisdom came from. I just told my mom, I said, uh, Do you mind? My, my oldest brother from my mom's side just got uh, uh, a job in Lagos. You know, he just got a job in Lagos. And um, uh, I, th I just told my, my, my mom, do you mind that I go to Lagos to visit my brother and spend some time with him? And he said, no problem. I will take my stuff home and I can you know, tell my dad that I've I gone to Lagos to visit my brother, spend a few weeks and I'll come back home. Okay, that was the last time that I stayed with my parents till today. Wow. That was the last time. Yeah. Going to Lagos, that was it for me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So that was the last time. What, what my mom took home that day, I never saw it again. <laughs> and they looked, my stuff from the body that was just it. Maybe I went home once and I just saw some things. But to go back to live with them, I never did. Wow. The, what, 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 what eventually happened was that by the time I got to Lagos to live with my brother, I actually realized that my brother had given his life to Christ. My oldest brother had given his life to Christ. Yeah. So it was a perfect place to be. Oh. <laughs> the perfect place to be it was uh it was the right place to be uh and it was very supportive very encouraging you know eventually my dad got to know that both of us had become christians um and but then it was just like well sort yourself out that kind of thing so i remember the day that i met my dad in lagos it was he came for an event in lagos and um, I met him up somewhere, maybe around Suriliri, and he was going back to Ibadan. You know the Presbyterian Church at Yaba, that Presbyterian yeah. Church at Yaba, yeah. and the Yaba up ahead. So that that place, you know, from you know from there, you can just link a Kolodu Road. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So that was where. He wow. was going as as you, you painted it, I just saw it now in my head. I said, "Wow." <laughs> <laughs> you know, so my, 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 my brother lived in Shomodo then and um, also in Yaba then. So it, it, it stopped for me to, to uh, you know, to get down from his car so I can maybe pick a bus and go back to my brother's house. Because he was visiting Lagos and he said I should uh, meet him up somewhere. And as I was dropping from his car, he just told me, so you have gained admission to university. I wish you all the best. Uh, but because you have not listened to everything I've been saying and blah, blah, blah. Your brother, who is also going your path, thank God he has gotten a job in a bank. He will be the one to send you to pay your school fees. So just go and meet him and tell him I've seen your admission letter, but both of you should be sorting yourself out. You know. So there that, are that, that ways that God just answers prayers uh, because he had a job there. And, you know, he told me, he said, I think the salary then was, um, I'm not mistaken, maybe 600 naira. Yeah. As, um, as an officer in the bank, and he said, um, what what do you need? Uh, he said, no, he said, this is my salary. If you want good life in university, you can go back to that. If you want to manage and keep your faith, you can stay here, and I will give you what I can afford to go to school. So, okay, I went to Ojota, Bus stop in Lagos, which was where you get a bus to the interlands to the other states. And I gained admission to Federal University of Technology at Korea to study mining engineering. The bus was 59 from Mojota to uh, Akure. 
And um, my brother told me, uh, I will only, I only can afford 250 naira, which was almost like for 40 percent of the salary. So you 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 get on the bus with 50 naira and the 200, you pay your school fees, whatever is remaining, you 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 manage till the end of the month. Then I will start to send you 150 naira every month, and that's the best I can do. Something like that. <laughs> that was how I went to university. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. So he literally paid my way to university, and um, but but God was there all through because going to university, I I I mean I was an engineering student, but from year one, from my hundred levels, I knew that God wanted me to do something in that on that university campus. Yeah. So by the time I was um, getting to my second year or so, uh, just as the time I was about getting to my second year, I started the fellowship with. A few friends, and I, I, I became a, a university pastor, a student pastor. <laughs> My first experience at leadership, yeah, uh, and starting from scratch with just a few friends. That fellowship is still there today. Uh, that fellowship started 26 years ago, wow. yeah. April of 1994. Yeah, so um, I I I didn't go home because after a while my brother said it's not it doesn't make sense for you to be coming to Lagos with fifty naira to and fro hundred naira to come and collect one fifty. <laughs> <laughs> so he found <laughs> so he, he found a way by which uh, he then realized that one of his banker friends was also working in a bank in Accra, which is in Ondo State where my school is. Uh, and that I can always go there to that bank. That, those days were nothing like money transfer or electronic banking. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll go to that one. You, I'll, I'll collect money from him. And then when he gets to Lagos, his family was in Lagos. So when he, he, when he got to Lagos over the weekend, then he will collect it back from my brother. That was how I got my monthly pay. So except it's important, I cannot leave school. Yeah. <laughs> As in, only day, if it's just two weeks or three weeks, I'd rather find a place except they lock down all the um, hostels mm -hmm. and they say everybody must go home there was, uh, there was nothing like going home we spent all those days praying fasting seeking god's face <laughs> and just having fun with, with you know playing games you know play football basketball and just read the bible all those holidays so you say oh there's one small um public holiday that someone like you just carry your bag and say, I'm, I'm going home. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know because I, I'm going home, a public holiday. Public holiday for what? You spend public holiday there because to get to Lagos is 50 naira by bus, and my monthly <laughs> allowance will be completely eroded. I mean, it was very simple. I saw my brother's uh, pay sleep. So that was how much he had. And I couldn't ask for money any other in, from any other person, you know. So, but it, it was a fantastic experience for me, uh, all through my university life, just living like that, very regimented lifestyle. But it was a very focused one, very focused one. You had time, I had time, you know, to do ministry, to develop myself spiritually. I mean, those were days where I listened to. Uh, uh, um, my pastor, Pastor Sam Adeyemi, and his pastor there, uh, Reverend George Adeboe. Uh, I remember when when I was going to Futa. You know, Pastor Sam came to Lagos in 1991 to start mm -hmm. Rema Chapel. He will tell his own story when when when. I know. <laughs> when he, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, he was in his twenties when he was posted to Lagos in 1991 to start Rema Chapel, uh, a branch of Rema Chapel from Ilorin, and that was when I met him. I met him in 1991. Next year, I will make it 30 years that he has been my pastor. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. Next year, wow. 30 years that he has been my pastor. I met him in 1991 how, at Raymond Chapel Casino Cinema. You said? How did you meet him? I just, okay, let me tell you how, how I met him. While I was in the bottom, in the boarding house, you know, I told you I got saved from the boarding house. So one of those guys that you know, I told you, I just told you a story now about Shebun Salami. I have so many. Yes, friends. yes. The Yankee boy. Shebun Salami, the Yankee boy. He's now, he's now in Atlanta, actually. He's a medical doctor in Atlanta now. He's a great guy. Oh, wow. uh, I mean, I, we, 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 
way. You know, we were able to hook up in Atlanta a couple of years ago. I was visiting the U.S. Wow. And that, but, uh, so there was also Olumide Williams. There was um, Gwe Gai Gira Pobe. There's um, um, who else can I remember? Muiwa Kweshe Tong. You know, uh, you know, Dotun Kusoya. Those were those boys. Now, I know Muiwa Kweshe Tong. I know Muiwa you know, Kweshe Tong. Yeah. Does he, is he, does he have a, a gap in his teeth? I think so. Wow, that's my sister's friend. Wow. Continue, continue, continue. <laughs> you know, so, uh, um, um, so those, those were my, my friends that were in government college together. But this is where I'm going. How I met Pastor Sam. Now, Pastor Victor, Reverend Victor Adeyemi, Pastor Sam's younger brother, was actually mm -hmm. posted to Ibadan first to start Rema Chapel in Ibadan. Mm -hmm. I think that must have been either 89 or 90, 1989 or 1990, when it was posted mm -hmm. to Ibadan to start Rema Chapel in Ibadan. One of my friends that God used to get me saved the, the, his parents attended Rema Chapel in Ibadan. That's the Olumide Williams. So they invited us to Dirovan's Hotel in Ibadan, where uh, Rema Chapel in Ibadan was at that time. Yeah, Wallan Hall of Dirovan's Hotel. I still remember very well. Yeah, wow. where Rema Chapel in Ibadan was. So uh, I, I went, I mean, this was probably uh, um, in a final class in, in government college. So I, I, I went and I, I I attended Rema Chapel. I saw Reverend Victor Adeyemi. Um, I I love this preaching. I love the church. But I couldn't go to church in Ibadan. You know, it was not possible. My parents were there, you know, and all that. So when I got to Lagos and I heard that Rema Chapel was also starting in Lagos, I didn't have a church. We don't have church. In, I mean, there's, I had to decide the church I would go. So I was mm -hmm. as a young boy, you understand. So when I got to to Lagos, I was then living with my brother in a one room apartment, and it was just the two of us. Then I had the liberty to go to church, and mm -hmm. I then had through my friends that that same Rema Chapel was starting in Lagos, and it was Pastor Victor's brother, older brother, that was coming to start it. So I located the place by fire by force. That was. <laughs> so that was how I, I got to meet Pastor Sam Adeyemi and became a member of Rema Chapel uh, in Casino Cinema then in Yaba in Lagos uh, and that was 1991 and um, so in 1995 when they start, was starting it was just a normal progression because he was my pastor you know <laughs> and yeah. I, 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 mean, I became quite close to him and all that so uh, my pastor was doing something you know, it was just a natural progression to 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 wow. follow through. So all the days I was in I was in Futa, he was mentoring me. He came, he came to preach in that fellowship. He came to bless the fellowship, pray over us and all that. So that was the kind of relationship we've had uh the last twenty nine going to thirty years now. So so from there you said I should tell the story of my life, right? So so from there, you know, finishing uh, university, graduated with a degree in mining engineering. I, 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 I trained with Shell in Port Harcourt. Uh, that was uh, 96. Um, and um, finished my internship, go back to do my final semester. And then um, um, started thinking about picking up engineering. Though I was pastoring as an undergrad pastor all that time, I knew God um, had called me to pastor, but I just was having that struggle. And also, um, as at the time, my my immediate older brother had also gotten saved. So three boys from my mom and three ladies. Yeah. So I have two brothers. They're older than me. I have own, I'm number five. So I have only one younger sister. Mm -hmm. So I have two older sisters and two older brothers. My two older brothers are pastors today. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but the oldest one was um, after me, which who was the one I lived with in Lagos. The, mm -hmm. the, the one in between us is a pastor in Scotland. He's in Aberdeen. He lives in Aberdeen, Scotland today. He's a pastor. He, he pioneered a ministry there. He pastors a church there. So that one just got saved. Again. And then uh, he it was, it was working. Uh, he got a job with a mobile, Exxon Mobile. So the, the guy had money. He got a job with Exxon Mobile. just got saved. And I was just living in university. He called me one day, he told me, he said, you know what? 
you know, we are all Christians. And uh, I know this pastor, pastor thing that they are doing in university, it will be good. You already trained Michelle. Just get a get welcome job. You can do ministry with it and all that. And that was the idea I had too because I had suffered all through university now. My dad, my dad had money, but I, my, I didn't touch it with my hand. I saved the little I stole before I got saved. I used to steal his money a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> uh, um, so that was what I wanted to do. Just, uh, so eventually, when I was posted to Delta State to worry to to do my youth service, I I also worked with a shell contractor, and I was just doing oil and gas. And I remember uh, meeting my pastor, coming back to Lagos, and met my pastor once, and I told him, you know, and he was he confronted me to say, God, man, you know, you had a calling to ministry. I said, hey, I know. And then what I'm going to do now is I'll come back to Lagos, uh, but I will look for a, a job with uh, maybe an oil servicing company. We'll just be going to the rig. I mean, my my final year project was on oil, oil work completion, you know. So how do you do all that? And then I mean, I I was used to going to the rig and all those things all through my training, you know. And after a, a school days, when when I worked for a shell contractor, I just wanted to be able to do. Two weeks off, two weeks on, come to Lagos, do my stuff, uh, work with my pastor, you know, at, uh, as at the time this had started, and then, you know, but thank God for mentors. Yeah, and thank God for great leaders. Um, it, it, the truth is that I never interviewed for a job at this time. It was uh, based on a relationship. I sat down, my pastor was asking me a question. So, what do you want to do with your life right now? Uh, you know, I said, okay, I'm back in Lagos. I look for an oil servicing company or uh, I'll go into management consulting, you know, and he will just be looking at me. After a few days, he will call, maybe one or two months, he will call me back. And so, you know, all until it got me to think and to pray. I remember going to redemption camp after one, having one encounter with him like that. Went to redemption camp for over the weekend, the RCCG camp uh, uh, in the outskirts of Lagos here. And uh, spent the weekend there just praying until I heard God clearly. Yeah. Said I will, he said that if I don't break my covenant with day and night, I will not break my covenant with you. This is what yeah. I wanted to do. I'm going to listen to the pastor and get, get you know, forget all this work and go and go and do ministry. Yeah. And then I went to meet my pastor and he said, it's okay. And he said, okay, um, there's an opening with Success Power. You know, we just started Success Power not too long there. Uh, that would, um, well, Pastor Ayodanes was the CEO of Success Power then. Said I should work with him so I can take over for him. So eventually I took over as CEO of Sources Power, uh, Chief Operating Officer, which was his uh, media ministry. You know, he used to do uh, Sources Power Radio. So back in the day, uh, we used to pack CDs. The CDs just started then. We we'll pack, like, if we want to do uh, a quarter recording, which is about 12, 13 recording, and we'll get 12 CDs. We'll mark the track. So when we get to the studio, uh, this engineer, Pastor will enter into the cubicle, you know, all those, uh, you know, we'll do like this, right. and then they'll start talking, and then yeah. um, they, it will slow down, and then they will slot in a, a CD and play maybe a Ron Kinoli or something, lift him up, <laughs> and then they'll bring it down, and then you will pick it up again. Very manual recording. <laughs> and I had, to, I had to program all that. <laughs> I had to program all that and all. So I, I did that, I enjoyed it. I took care of his resources, his materials, uh, duplicating tapes, you know, doing all, all sort of all, all, all sort of stuff. But you know, you can't be uh, at the well and not be wet. Uh, mm. I mean, preparing, sitting with his his, his message, uh, du duplicating tapes. I mean, back in the day, it was tapes. It would duplicate tapes overnight, self. You know, traveled with him everywhere and all that. I eventually then became a full-time associate pastor and then left Success Power. And then now, this I a pastor in the church and all. And um, the rest, like you say, is history. I did that up to 2010. Yeah. Uh, and eventually became the most senior associate <laughs> in the same ministry. Uh, yeah. Know, working hand in hand with Pastor Sam and Pastor Nikki Adeyemi. Also, October 2010. Uh -huh when I was released to, to plan the Elevation Church. So October this year, over 10 years, that the Elevation Church in Lagos, Nigeria has been in existence. Um, 10 years? And, yeah, yeah, 10 years. Wow. Uh, and it's been an interesting journey. Um, and, uh, you know, a great one for that matter. 
uh, we thank God for the, the different lives that have been touched. But my life, I didn't look like it. Wow. Um, I didn't look wow. like it. I, wow. it. It really didn't cross my mind that uh, I will be doing some of the things I'm doing today. Nothing qualified me for this more than grace. Not even my lineage. Mm -hmm. My lineage disqualified me completely. <laughs> yeah, because I grew I grew up reading Quran, no Bible. I never attended Sunday school, not once in my life. <laughs> you wow. understand? So, <laughs> so wow. not this is, your story me. Your story is so inspiring and I'm just listening to you and I know a lot of people are watching now that are like proteges. But in this dispensation, in this generation, they don't want to serve. They believe, oh, I don't need you. Oh, no, no, me, I know what I'm doing. You know, I, this is how. You're telling someone, I have walked down this path. This is how to do it. The person thinks, no, I want to do it like this. And they try like five times, it's failing. And they're like, let me do it again the way I want to do it. What do you think is responsible for the generation? They don't want to serve. They want everything quick now microwave i'm not ready to wait what is, okay let me ask this question what is the role of, of service in destiny fulfilling destiny and then um what let's say that one first what is the role of service and um i'll ask the second one you know service service serves a few purposes in destiny one is that it, it gives you an opportunity to sow seed mm. and if you don't have seed in the ground you don't have anything to harvest in the future. Mm. So there are things that happen to people like us. I just saw my friend, uh, I think this uh, he, he, I think he's on the platform. I just oh, saw please, him. Yeah. I mean, please, some, please, yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, I, wow. I saw Anna, this one there. Yeah. I'm sure you will hear us very soon again now. See, uh, um, <laughs> so someone, I mean, I'm not surprised that he's doing great because we serve together. And see, he's, he's there. Yeah, I can see it. Pastor really Yo. <laughs> You know, so I'm not surprised that he's doing well because of service. These are people that I serve with, I serve my pastor with, uh, and many other people. Time will not permit me, you know, to, to mention. So, uh, service is a seed, service also positions you to sharpen your cutting edge. Yeah, you can't give what you don't have. You know, the, 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 the 1000 hour rule, which says that to gain proficiency. And to get to the top 3% or top 1% in any field, you have to invest 10,000 hours of practice. Now, when you sell, uh, you, you start to, you know, front load that your 10,000 hours of practice in service. And then overall, it's a seed. So apart from it sharpening you inside out, it gives you seed that you can leverage in the future. Uh, the, 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 what, what we're dealing with right now is that uh, people, our world has changed a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. our world has changed a lot. Um, in the last 20 to 30 years, a lot has changed. And what we see more is that people see that things tend to now happen fast and there are many ways to blow, like they say. Uh, to so blow. For some, <laughs> yeah, for some people, ministry is just one of those ways. And so mm -hmm. if I... And if I do something, you know, for one or two years, I know, I, I, I don't know how it's done. So you, you, you can't dictate to me again. You can't hold me down. And a lot of people also don't know the value of mentoring. Yeah, the value of mentoring. Uh, simply, if I would describe mentoring to you in a very simple way, it is the difference between climbing stairs and entering the elevator. Mm. Yeah, that's what mentoring does to you. Yeah. You can choose to climb the stairs. You can still get there. It's going to be more strenuous. It's going to be mm -hmm. slower. Mm -hmm. It's going to take more time. It's going to take more energy. But if you mm -hmm. go the route of great mentoring, you know, it, it, sometimes it just looks like, almost like, as if things are just sure. happening. You know when elevator just kind of... You, you know you are moving. You know you have to enter. You know you have to arrange yourself. But the, the effort and the energy, and then you will be able to sidestep mistakes that other people have made in time past because we are learning from them. Uh, mm. And to a large extent, I've experienced that. Uh, I, I, I'm always grateful to God that he gave me a mentor, not a tormentor. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Wow. You know what you're saying now is what this place is all about. We're trying to let this generation know that, listen, there is a process and you can't skip that process. It doesn't matter how talented you are because you give another perspective to what, because when people serve, they think about what they're, they're doing for the person. You know, that's the perspective. And then I went to carry the bag for him. And then he did this. He did. That's what how we see it, this generation. But you just changed the paradigm now. You said that you have, it's an opportunity to sow seeds. So perhaps if they see it like that more, they'll realize that, man, any opportunity I get to serve. This is my 100 of the 10,000 hours. This is my 50. So it's like you're clocking in anytime you're serving. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. My other, my other question is this. So we're talking about mentoring, which is a shortcut to success. You know, honey, I told you, because they're falling into a pit. You don't have to do it, right? What, when it comes to separation, separation, you served for a long time. And you know, when you serve close to someone, you see their humanity, you see their divinity, because that's what proximity. Oh, did you see it? I'm not rhyming. Is it natural? <laughs> yeah, I was rapping. <laughs> I'm not rapping. But you see their humanity, their divinity. That's what proximity does, right? You know? When it comes to separation, and then I have my own vision, I want to go. A lot of people nowadays, they just leave. They leave, they burn the bridges, they break the ladder, they, you know. What is the importance of leaving and leaving well so that that transition is so smooth that, you know, is it like, because I've seen people that separate with strife and then they don't do well. Is there a blessing connected to you living well and transitioning well. There's a huge blessing that's connected to living well and transitioning well. Uh, just simply look at the story of Abraham and Lot. Lot left anyhow. Lot didn't have, he, he didn't have sense. Yeah, that, that guy <laughs> didn't have sense. Yeah. If I, if, if, I saw, if, I, if I meet him in heaven, I will ask him, what, what was wrong with you? Eh? <laughs> you, you think, did God call you? It's not Abraham that God called. God now joined you to a called man and it, enter, it entered your head to the point that your uncle will be telling you to pick first. Pick Even if you're not a Yoruba man like me, you're not a Yoruba man, you should still have sense. <laughs> you, are, you are a Jew. You should still have sense that you cannot pick before your uncle. You understand? If not that, you know, the thing is just shocking you. And that's how many young people behave today. Yes. Uh, they just feel that they know too much. Lot felt he knew too much. I mean, for those people who may not be familiar with Lot, I'm talking about Abraham and Lot in the Bible. Yeah. Lot felt he, he knew too much. God called Abraham, not Lot. Lot went with him. And then it got to a point, Lot became a big boy. He also had servants. The servants of Abraham and servants of Lot, they were quarreling. And uh, Abraham said, uh, this place is, is, is not going to be big enough for you know all of us so let, let's let's you pick and then lot looked at sodom a very good place because they were looking for good stuff you know without the, the so in the investment seeds. yeah yeah without investment, so yeah. In investment. Yeah. then he picked that place and it ended badly and that's how i mean that's our lesson from the scriptures that it will always end badly when you just choose to just uh, uh you just want Jaffa. to get out so just want Jaffa. To, uh, yeah, just, just go your own way and just do <laughs> like that. That's how it always ends. That's how it always ends. You need to live uh, um, as much as possible. Try to live with a blessing. As much as possible, try to live with instructions. Try to live with admonition. Uh, I must say that some mentors, like I said before, some mentors are actually like tormentors. I have been so blessed of God to have my kind of mentor. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you cannot second guess about my pastor is that he has your best interest at heart. Yes. Intention. You can't say that of every mentor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't say that of every mentor. So that's where the problem is. So we can't talk about this without addressing the, both sides of the coin, which is that uh, um, a mentor has something to put on the table. A prodigy also has something to put on the table. Mm -hmm. um, a mentor should not become a tormentor. Um, mm -hmm. What you get out of that is rebellion. 
Mm. But even when your mentor is behaving like a tormentor, you must know that you cannot afford to sow a negative seed. Mm. Yeah. You can walk away, but you walk away so quietly. You don't say the wrong thing with your mouth. You don't bad mouth that kind of person. You just, you just, just walk away. Yeah. Quietly. Wow. I think it was uh, Pastor Matthew Ashimolo that once told me, he said, uh, you must not slam a door that you know that you may have to open again. Yeah. So you close every door on every relationship gently because you don't know whether you will need to open that door again. If you slam it and the thing hook and it's a door that you still have to pass through in the future into the fullness of your destiny, that means mm. that destiny has hooked. Yeah. Mm. So that, that's, that's the wisdom in closing doors gently because in life, there are doors we need to close. Sometimes it's just temporary. So you don't just jam it, jam it. you know, like, uh, you know, to hell with this door. No, you, you, you deal with it very, you know, gently. Uh, yeah. Because sometimes people are pushed to misbehave. And it's always a test. It's always a test. Didn't David face the same thing with Saul? Saul was cranky, crazy. And whatever, whatever you know, whatever it, it, was, it was, it was all the negative word that you can think. So why would God position a David without, beside that kind of a person? Just to be able to test David. Will he pass the test? And mm. David passed the test. Yeah. He would wow. rather not leave, I mean, not go against God to get to the throne than go against God to get to the throne. So that's a lesson in when you get a tormentor, not a mentor. Because Saul mm. was a tormentor to his spirit. In fact, he wanted to, 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 to mm. kill him. It was that bad. But David still will not do anything against Saul. Yeah. And he, he had the opportunity to kill him. He won't do that. Yeah. He never rebelled against him. When Saul's time was over, God took him out in his own way. And David ascended the throne. Mm. So we, we don't have to, I mean, young people need to know wherever God has ordained for you to get to, you will get there. And it's not going to be by bullying your way through and by, you know, talking to, or, you know, older people or people that are mentoring you anyhow. No, it's not going to happen that way. It's going to happen because God is going to open the doors for you and pour his grace upon you and is watching mm -hmm. how you deal with people that he has anointed and graced in the past. Yeah. Because what you do mm -hmm. today is a seed for the future. It's a seed. It's a seed. Ah, man, we need to keep saying that because a lot of people don't see it as a seed. People slide into my DM, cuss me out, and then when I now respond, they're like, oh, sorry, I was just trying to get your attention. You know? And I'm like, you know, they don't understand that it's a seed. Because if we really saw it from our perspective that every opportunity I get is a seed. It's either I'm harvesting something or I'm sowing something. So if we don't see it from that perspective, and the question I was going to ask, you already answered it. I was going to say, okay, we have four minutes more. But I was going to say, um, how do, what is the role of my perspective? Well, you already said it, but I want, I'll ask it anyway. So if you have another light to shed on it, what is the role of my perspective? Because when doors slam in our faces, we sulk. We start to think the, the world is against us and we take the bitter position. Eh? My daddy kicked me out of the house. I will show him eh? in my life. I will show my mommy, you know, and all that stuff. And when we see from that, you know, perspective that those lenses were already wrong because there's no way we would sow good seeds when our, you know, focus is wrong. So how as a young child or as a teenager or someone watching now, how can I correct or fix my lenses when negative things happen to me? How can I channel that so that I use it for positive things? You know, like you said, David said all this, that how can I sin against God? He was never saying, how can I sin against Saul? How can I do this? Cut your cloak, um, put this pair in your head. How can a young... How can a young man cleanse his ways? That's scripture. But for real, the question is, how can I change my perspective when things happen to me so that I see the situation right? Yeah. I, I, I think it's all about, see, whether you are a Christian or not, you have to always understand that the future is not vague. We create the future. We don't just wish for the future. We create the future. The way this, the universe is configured is, is that uh, you can, it, 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 it's cause and effect. And it, this, the Bible is replete with that. That's what we call sowing and reaping. It's cause and effect. Uh, the effect you want 
is uh, or you get is based on the the the, the, the cost the, 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 the what you created yeah so as a young person i'm also always have it at the back of my mind i don't have to be a follower of jesus christ to know that this whole world does not exist like a vacuum it is cause and effect if i want something in the future i must do something today that will program me for it so this mindset of things just happen uh we, we should come off it things don't just happen a a reason a a, a a great person make things happen it makes things happen not just waiting for things to happen you know mm -hmm. we say that three different kinds of people in this world uh the ones who watch things happen the ones who wonder what is happen happening and the ones who make things happen exactly. yeah so you need to you know to tell yourself i want to be one of the people who make things happen and one of the ways to make things happen is to live a principle centered life and one of the greatest principles of all time is that what you sow you shall reap yeah, yeah. it's only the mercy of god that can make one not so i mean not reap what you sow yeah. wow it's only the mercy of god that's where mercy prevails over judgment and it's god wow. is prerogative he has prerogative of mercy wow yeah. so <laughs> wow thank you so much pastor governor we have 12 seconds left thank you so much for coming to bookie's place taking time out god bless you we say we share the same mentor so we're the same family love you so much yeah. god